Good evening. Good evening, good evening and welcome. I'm Crystal Collins Judd, the president of Sarah Lawrence College, and I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight to our fourth panel in this year's series on difference in dialogue. And I'm delighted to welcome our two interlocutors for tonight's dialogue, DeRay McKesson and Sanford Unger. Um, let me outline briefly the format for the evening and then I'll offer the introductions. Um, we will uh, start with the first half with DeRay and Sanford in a back and forth in a dialogue for 30 to 45 uh, minutes, uh, probing the uh, on the topic, probing the bounds of free speech, after which we will have 30 to 45 minutes of questions from the audience. And our ground rules for these panels for this series, uh, Difference in Dialogue, as most of you know, is that the questions start first from the students in the audience, and only at the point at which the students have run out of questions do the rest of you get to engage. Um, we are an academic institution. We're focused on uh, uh, the experience of our students, and we're delighted, though, to be joined tonight by, um, by uh, students, faculty, staff, alumni, members of the board, uh, neighbors from the community, and, and to have you all here tonight. Um, the panel is being recorded and will be available on video uh, after the session. So let me introduce our two, um, our two panelists, our two interlocutors, and then I will let them get to it. DeRay McKesson is a civil rights activist, a podcaster, and an author. Born and raised in Baltimore, he graduated from Bowdoin College in 2007, where he majored in government and legal studies. He served as president of his class and as president of the Bowdoin Student Government. And while he was president of the Bowdoin Student Government, I was dean for academic affairs at Bowdoin, so we have a, we have a long relationship. Um, he holds honorary doctorates from the New School and from the Maryland Institute uh, College of Art. DeRay has advocated for issues related to children, youth, and families since he was a teen. The death of Mike Brown and the subsequent protest in Ferguson, Missouri, and beyond spurred DeRay to focus on confronting the systems and structures that have led to mass incarceration and to police killings of black and other minority populations. As a leading voice in the Black Lives Matter movement and a co-founder of Campaign Zero, DeRay has worked to connect individuals with knowledge and tools and provide citizens and policymakers with common sense policies that ensure equity. He was praised by President Obama for his work as a community organizer. DeRay is the host of the award-winning weekly podcast, Pod Save the People. He frequently appears on national media outlets and he's the author of On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope. Sanford J. Unger is President Emeritus of Goucher College, Director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University now. He has been Director of the Voice of America and Dean of the School of Communications at American University. During his journalism career, he was a staff writer for the Washington Post, the Washington editor of The Atlantic, managing editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, and co-host of All Things Considered on NPR. He's the author or editor of six nonfiction books. He earned an AB in government magna cum laude from Harvard College and a master's degree in international history from the London School of Economics. He teaches undergraduate seminars on free speech at both Georgetown University and Harvard College. We're delighted to welcome um, San Sanford and DeRay this evening and thank them for joining us and I welcome you and off you go. I remember when Crystal got hired at Bowdoin. So it's so great to see uh, you as the president of Sarah Lawrence. It's good to be here. It's great to be here with everybody. We're excited to be in conversation today. Definitely excited about your challenges and your questions and your pushes. DeRay, it's good to see you. Let me make sure this is on. It is, is, are you hearing me? Yes. It's good to, good to see you again, DeRay. And uh, we are a sort of an odd couple on this subject, but we have some interesting views, I think, to, to exchange this evening. Um, the, the stated topic for our conversation has something to do with the boundaries of free speech. And uh, we're going to uh, go into some of the things you've said in your remarkable book, which I commend to you, and you'll have an op the members of the audience will have an opportunity to, to buy it afterwards um, and, and get it autographed by DeRay. But I, I want to start by exploring this issue of the boundaries of free speech. Do you, do you think there are, uh, there ought to be, and that there are uh, boundaries properly called that on free speech in, in American society. 
I don't, you know, I'm always, I'm always a little perplexed about the way we talk about free speech because there's a question of like free for who and, and how do we talk about free speech in the absence of talking about the imbalance of power? So when we think about like, you know, what's not protected under the First Amendment is speech that incites violence. And I can think about a lot of speech that I've seen that incites violence and it, that has incited violence in the not too distant past. And, I, and that never is a part of the conversation. People talk about it like there are two sides. It's like there aren't two sides to whether white supremacy is right or bad. There's one side, right? And like, they're just bad. And, uh, and that is real to me. You know, I'm always mindful that, you know, who didn't get profiled in the New York Times is the people who walked into the newspaper in Annapolis and shot up the newspaper. Like, they don't have profiles. And you know why they didn't get profiled is because people understand that giving those ideas a platform is dangerous and that it leads to real negative outcomes. But when we talk about things like race, people are like, oh, you know, you've seen spreads of Richard Spencer, the, the white nationalist, which is like code for white supremacy. We've seen spreads of him in like beautiful clothes as if that's like a legitimate position. So I always worry about this idea of like talking about free speech in the absence of talking about uh, the imbalance of power. Uh, I, I agree with that. I think we should talk about that. How do you think somebody like Richard Spencer, uh, he is a good example to discuss, why does he have this sort of somehow charmed existence, this, this image? Uh, here's a guy who gave a Nazi salute at his rally to celebrate Donald Trump's election, somebody who speaks badly about everybody who's not like him. What, what's his magic? Why, why does this culture still seem to allow him to have a spot of honor? He's trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> like, whiteness is his magic. I don't know, like, but. <laughs> yeah, but, but wait a minute. He's, he's uh, there are a lot of people who have a characteristic of whiteness without, without succumbing to being Richard Spencer. Yeah, but I think that, so here's my push though. See, he, this is why he's trying to get me in trouble is, uh, Sandy, is, here's the thing is that it is, it is only in, so he is not, you know who does not think he's charming is any black lead publication. No, no, no oh, black lead publication. Because uh, it is, the New York Times can do it because they're not, they're not threatened by him. You know, like he's not saying that they shouldn't exist and they aren't whole people. And that is, that is the power of whiteness. Like it is one of the potencies of the way supremacy actually works. Um, Again, like, you know, who is not on the cover of the New York Times is people who think that the press should be burned. You know, like those people aren't getting from, nobody's calling those people charming. And I'm sure some of them like yeah. took their dogs out to walk too, you know, but like we don't see those, those people being shown. And it is, you know, the, the magic power is like the same magic power that wrote the First Amendment. Like who thought, you know, we should be reevaluating all these things. Like who thought that like people that, Whoever imagined that we would be doubling down that like people who thought that we should sell and trade people made the best government? Like we should be reevaluating re all this stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> like none of this is sacred. Well, I mean, we've all read the we've all read the First Amendment with the possible exception of Donald Trump, and <laughs> and uh, it is by and large durable. I mean, it 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 holds up. It's a it's a noble statement of five freedoms most important of which in my personal view is free speech, which en en enables all the others. But uh, are, why is the First Amendment in trouble now? Why, why, are, why are so many people, I mean, you get these polls when people say, if a newspaper criticizes the government, it should be shut down. I mean, a substantial number of people say that. How do we get there? Yeah, I don't, how do we get there is, is sort of a, an interesting question. I think that for a lot of people, we've been at a place where, uh, speech wasn't too free. I think about being in the street in St. Louis when we were in the street when the protests began in Ferguson in 2014. Uh, it didn't seem very free then. And the only thing I had in my hand was a cell phone and the truth, you know? Like, what was I gonna do? We would always say to the police, like, what am I gonna do with this cell phone? You have like three guns, you know, not even just one gun. You have three. What am I possibly gonna do to you with this cell phone? And so like, we knew in that moment that it wasn't free. You think about Charlottesville, is if you saw the videos in Charlottesville, there were people like literally pushing that, white supremacists were pushing the police. like literally pushing them. If I pushed the police, I'd be in memoriam right now. There'd be no, there'd be no talk about it. It would be a very different story. So I don't think that this is new. I think that Trump has actually heightened this conversation about like, yes. you know, speech on both sides. I think that we are, I think that one of the faults of the left is this sort of like 
utopic vision that like we should discuss everything and like we actually don't need to discuss white supremacy all that much as like this no, nuanced yeah. thing you know we don't need to discuss homophobia as this like balanced argument it's like some things there are just there's not two sides there's like a right side and a wrong side and those are the only two sides well trump has a very interesting notion of open discussion which is that when confronted with a truth that he doesn't like he tells a lie and then he demands equal time for his lie and the mediated truth. And a lot of people fall for that. A lot of people, well, he's the President of the United States, he deserves fairness, balance, equal, equal time, equal coverage. And that has put, uh, that's put a lot of people into a dilemma of how to, uh, you know, it's quite remarkable that editors and headline writers and journalists in general are willing to say that Trump lied. I mean, just flat out say it. It happens to be true, but it, was a big leap that people were going to say. And finally, the press is saying that he's a bully, and it's only because he's starting to bully them. You know, and it's like... <laughs> That's right. He was a bully before he took the mic from Jim Acosta. He was a bully before he took uh, his pass, you know? And I worry about what does it mean when the press is only willing to tell the truth when they are the people who are victims? And I, I think about that, too, in this moment of... You know, there are a lot of people who thought the history of injustice in this country began with the Muslim ban. They were like, wow, the country got bad. You're like, the country was bad for a lot of people <laughs> for a long time, right? And like, just because it is on the front page of the New York Times every day doesn't mean that there weren't bad things happening. So when I think about this whole Trump phenomenon, it's like, will people still be this energized and engaged when the threat isn't so obvious, when it isn't in people's face every day in the same way? That's, I think that's like a real question. That's a really good question because we're so mobilized right now. We're so we're at such a fever pitch, and he keeps us there. He seems to think that's a good idea, and that serves him well. And but the press, like, enables it. You know, it's like, oh. I will say, so, you know, I don't watch the press conferences anymore because it's just too much. And I'm still shocked that I'm shocked. You know, he'll say stuff, and I'm like, I didn't even know. And today I was reminded of, I don't know if you saw the press conference after the midterms where he said, Mia Love showed me no love, that's why she lost. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> um, Mia Love showed me no love, that's why she lost. And then she go, he goes, too bad. And you're like, what? You're like, this man is, has lost it. But there is something, you know, you didn't see every single statement that Barack Obama said flashed across the, you didn't see that, you know what I mean? Like, this is sort of an unparalleled time where like every time this man has a random thought, it's just like primetime news, and that is a choice. And we actually don't, the media is responsible for doing this over and over and over. And like, we know that his language is radicalizing people and like giving people a home. Uh, and we don't have to participate in that. You think about some of the studies show that the people least likely to differentiate between fact and opinion are people who believe in television news the most. Those oh, are the sure. people, I'm like, sure least sure. likely, the people most likely are people like you who get your news from the internet. Uh, and the reason that is, is that you're, you are able to, like, fact check things just really quick. You're like, is that true? No. Did I? The people who believe these, the news is really the people who watch Fox. It's like, <laughs> that is dicey, you know? Like, it's just not true. Well, let, let's, let's uh, drill down a little bit on some of these issues about the media and particularly there's one thing you said in your book that is uh, stuck in my craw for a few days now, um, in which you said that reporters cannot simply be the voyeurs of our pain, uh, page 18. Uh, you seem to be saying to an overly careful reader, perhaps, that reporters have to choose a side. They, 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 they can't just be the voyeurs of, of the pain of black people and other victims of discrimination in, in this society. You want to sp spell that out a little bit? Yeah, I push and say that reporters always choose a side. What was interesting about St. Louis is that there were a lot of reporters who came into town being like, I'm going to tell this objective truth and da 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 da. And, and what that really meant is that they believe the police because that's the way that society sort of constructed is that the government has an official statement. And so the police would say, like, this happened at three o'clock and da da. And then the reporters were just like, say it. And I'll never forget. So Don Lemon, the Don Lemon you see on TV now is woke Don. That wasn't who we had in 2014. And I remember Don, like, he was just not helpful. And then Don got <laughs> tear gassed, and it was great, because you were like, Don, we told you they was tear gassing people, and you didn't believe us till you had to run into your little CNN van, because you got tear gassed. 
And then all of a sudden, he started to be much more critical of the police statements, and we were like, thank you, you know? But it was, it was a lot of those moments. I will never forget in the early days, we saw um, there were reporters who were wearing helmets. You're like, you out here in a helmet, you know what I mean? Like, you can't tell us that this isn't dangerous for everybody, you know what I mean? And it was those sort of moments that we were saying to people, like, you actually don't get to just like, come here and just write these random stories like you actually need to be implicated in the moment and i do think that that's one of the things that actually changed the way that all of you probably experienced the protests in st louis is that the reporters were like i remember one night where we got ran off the main street and we were in the street for a long time so we were in the street for 400 days and uh, it, this was early we got ran off the street and the protesters we were sort of on a side street but we could still see the main street and this one reporter was determined not to get run off so he's like at the corner on the main street and he is still videoing everything and he's a reporter so the police is sort of giving him a little a little leeway but we could see him and i and i remember watching him and literally like out of a tv show the police shoot a canister of tear gas like right under his van so he's like he's shooting and then all of a sudden it's just like tear gas and this man freaks out and what was amazing about it is that his coverage from that day on was like, oh, he was a whole different person. He was like radicalized news. <laughs> You're like, thank you, you know, because it was like people just didn't believe us. And then when reporters had proximity to it, they were like, OK, this is true. Well, it, it changed the way they asked questions. It changed the way they pressed. It was important. Look, I mean, that's been true for a long time when there have been many instances in not so distant American history when the opposition was not functioning so much as an opposition. I mean, voting for appropriations on, on Vietnam when the public was against the war in Vietnam. And it took people in the streets and the media and reporters writing, and in those days mostly writing, about what was happening. And well, in Vietnam it was also television, of course. But uh, still, I think the code of journalistic behavior and ethics tells people you have to preserve some element of neutrality. You have to, you have to keep your distance from the movement you're covering uh, or someone will capture you and, and, and there will be some question of your credibility in how you cover it. So that's really, uh, I, I wonder how that applies today, not, not you know, I mean, I understand exactly what you're saying about what happened in the streets of, of, of Ferguson. But in a day-to-day -day way, what is your expectation of what reporters will do now with respect to the movement that you're a part of? Yeah, I just don't know what it means to be neutral in the face of white supremacy, right? I don't know right. what it means to be neutral in the face of homophobia and, and transphobia and misogyny. Like, I just don't know what that actually yeah. functionally well, I'm looks not, like. I'm not suggesting... Uh, neutrality in the face of those forces. Uh, but that's I, what it is. That's I what is happening neutrality. in real life right now, you know? Well, but there are, there are subtler stories to be covered. It's not just, not every story is, is white supremacy or homophobia or transphobia and, and so on. There, there are subtler stories. There are, there are stories in greater depth uh, that do emerge and where Reporters have greater credibility if they appear to stand back and, and examine the, the, the subtleties of those stories. Yeah, so my challenge would be that I think that the lifestyle stories, like those stories are fine, right? Like there, there aren't two sides to the like somebody saving the dog in the tree. I'm, yeah, I'm okay with you being neutral, like whatever that looks like. <laughs> but you think about, so I don't know if you saw today that Trump has ordered the military to put down barbed wire where the, the caravan is coming. Yeah. and. Then the AP's headline is like, uh, Trump orders barbed wire to be set as caravan draws near. And that is a political choice. The, car the caravan is 1,200 miles away. Right. That is not near, right? But like they are actually participating in this like fear mongering and like that's a choice. You know what That I mean? has been going on from the beginning of the story because Trump is able to use words that evoke yeah, but the AP did that. That wasn't, like, Trump's statement No, I mean the caravan, the use of the word caravan. In, in what respect is this a caravan? I don't... Yeah, I don't. no, I agree. But I'm just saying, like, the AP could have been, like, Trump puts barbed wire down to fear monger. That would also be true. Do you know what I mean? Like, but as You're draws, expecting too much. I just, I'm expecting something, you know? Like, 
I just worry about the way uh, the way that this looks. You even think about the story you all you all read about Botham Jean, who was the black man who the white officer went to his apartment and shot him dead. And like the yeah. the original reporting around that was like. It was like, did she go into that? Like, was it her apartment? Was she confused? Like, the first couple of days were like, she was just confused and walked in. And then as the reporting got a little more clear, it was like, she literally just walked into this man's apartment and killed him. But the initial reporting like created all this like circumstantial, like, oh, well, she parked, it was late at night. And you're like, that is a choice to actually tell the story in these ways. That strained credibility. And I think that people saw that. People didn't believe that story. I mean, that's what you can count on is the, the public skepticism of the way some stories are told. And, that's, and I think that's a protection so that, so that uh, reporters don't have to, always have to choose the side. This was, this was a huge thing in the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement. There were times, it was, it was clear where everybody's sympathies were the, in, in the media, but they had to talk to people on the other side. They had to have access to people at certain moments, and so they couldn't reveal their natural biases. Yeah, I don't, I, I think that there's something dangerous about always taking the high ground, and I think that the left is like obsessed with taking the high ground, and I think yeah. that we might take it to oblivion. I think that the, I, Fox News is not trying to hear all sides. Oh, you know Fox I mean? News is not trying to take the high they ground. They are, no. well, they are certainly not trying to take the high ground. <laughs> That's certainly But like, they have doubled except down today, on like, Except today, when they. What uh, did they do today? When, well. <laughs> Well, maybe it was with... maybe it was yesterday when they when they joined CNN's lawsuit against against Trump. I know not we, brave. Let, let, let's talk about that for a minute. Let, let's let's talk about this it, lawsuit against Trump by for Jim Acosta's uh, White House news pass. I think that the world is so wild that our standards are even lower, and like the thought that Fox and CNN sue the White House for taking Jim Acosta's badge is seen as bravery. And you're like, that's not brave, right? No, I don't say it seems bravery, but I think it, it is a, a little flash of a moment when little Fox, flash. little one, very little, little. one, I'll, I'll agree with that. But when Fox is saying, we are reporters, we realize, as they should, that if you can take away Jim Acosta's pass for CNN today, you can take away the pass from somebody at Fox News who's, who's not sufficiently uh, prostrate on, uh, before Trump next week, next month, next year. They recognize that they do have a higher calling of some sort. It's a little hard to be persuaded of that by Fox, I'll admit. Yeah, I think that brave to me would be like no reporters coming back to the White House until they figure this stuff out. Like that would be brave to me. It would be courageous if like CNN, MSNBC, if they just stop showing the the press conferences, like that to me would be a sign of courage. This lawsuit is like, you know, well, Sanders literally, she comes, the next day she was like, we doubled down and we had the right to do it. And you're like, okay. Yeah, but I think it might be fun to watch nobody coming to the White House. It might be fun to see Sarah Sanders standing there and just talking to Fox News but the American people would lose a lot of information. As I, don't, I don't think so. I think that, you know, we didn't, we did not, first of all, I don't know if information is what we're getting out of these press conferences. I think that we might be getting a lot of something. I don't know if it's information. And the second is that you think about all the presidential administrations that we survived without seeing a press conference every single day. We survived. We did not see, it's so wild to think about how little of Obama we saw when you think about how much of Trump you're seeing, you know? Like you see so, I feel like I see this man every single day, whether I want to or not. It's like, I feel like I only saw Obama at like ceremonies, dedications. Well, you could stop like watching huge. him, DeRay. You don't, you don't have to watch Trump every day. I mean, you can turn off the two. I wish. It's, he's on everything, you know? And well, I think that that is like a, it is sort of wild to see people, to see the media participate in this, especially as he attacks the media. So, you know, I'm hopeful that something might change. I'm certainly hopeful about the midterms. I, they, they were good. I'm excited potentially to see what happens in uh, Georgia. I'll be in Georgia on December 4th if Stacey gets the recount. So that'll be, or like the revote, the runoff. Excited about hopefully what happens in Florida with, with Gillum. Um, did you even know that there's a Senate race in uh, Mississippi, Mike yes. Espy in Mississippi? Yeah. I didn't know that until recently. Who knew? Um, so excited about Mike Espy in, in Mississippi, who could be the other black senator. So excited about those things. And hopefully this will like push the tide. And hopefully this administration will change dramatically now that the Democrats have the House. Uh, I want to go back to that White House thing for a minute. 
do you really think that we would be safe if we weren't watching the White House in a kind of daily manner? I mean, I, I, we, you and I talked about this earlier today. Um, Trump does so much damage when the lights are on, when the lights are off in the darkness, when, when people are boycotting the White House, how will we know what he's doing? How will we, we won't have people there asking him those questions in, in the light of day, well, or we asking well, his the, representatives the questions. You know, all the leaks that come out of the White House and the newspaper, I think they will be fine. You know, like I think that people will keep talking. It's like, what value is it to watch a rally where he's slamming Maxine Waters? There's no, yeah. there's like no, that's well, not I a policy statement, but that is what we're seeing though. Like yeah. that, we're seeing more of that, Name three like policy things that Trump has said that he's like announced on TV that have been the first announcement. Like you can't, that Space Force is the last thing that I saw come out of him. And Space Force, I had to Google to make sure that wasn't a joke. You know, I was like, is Space Force a real new program? And like, it is called Space Force, right? That is what it is. I think called. it's called yeah, Space Force. Yeah, that's ridiculous. I, so, I have zero belief that it will ever happen. But yes, I think it's called. Yeah, so we don't. I actually think that like the when you map out the speeches that you've seen that have actually been substantive policy arguments that like move the national conversation, you can count them on half of one hand. You know, like that's not what we're seeing, and I think that that is. I think that that is true. I, I think that people. I think that the he's such a ratings getter that that is why people are. Oh yeah, well that's that's what it, all he wants is the attention. He he cares more about the constant attention than about public understanding of positions that he himself doesn't understand. I know, I'm saying we don't have to participate in that. I'm saying the news well, participates yeah, well, in that. Well, there I have to disagree. I, I, don't, I, I, think, I think the media need to define the terms of, of that engagement better, but I would be frightened not to have, not his rally, not his rally speeches, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the day-to-day -day works of government that will show you for withdrawing this one pass, we just won't won't cover the day-to-day -day workings of the White House. I, I think that's dangerous, personally. Yeah, I think that, again, I think that that is like a double standard opinion that like, again, I'm always reminded of how little we saw of President Obama when I think about how much I see of this man say nothing. You know, it's, it's interesting to look back. I'm, I'm an unabashed admirer of President Obama's and, and of Michelle's, frankly. Um, but there are some things that didn't get covered very thoroughly because people were so enchanted with him. For example, he and Eric Holder brought more legal cases against people for leaking government documents than all other presidents combined before him. And he had promised great openness in government, but not only were there not whistleblower protections under President Obama, there were whistleblower punishments. For, for leaks of information. And you may not know about that because it hasn't been covered very much. No, but I do know, and it did get covered. And I think that like, you know, I'm friends with Chelsea Manning, I'm friends with um, Ed Snowden, and you know, Chelsea got out under, under right. that administration. You know, I'm, I talked yes. to Snowden and I said to Snowden, what did you think about, um, what did you think about Obama? And he was like, you know, we didn't agree about everything clearly because you know, he's still in Russia and um, yeah that whole thing, but, uh, but he said, which I thought was really interesting, he was like, I don't think Obama would kill me. You know, and he, like even Snowden was able to have like a, he's like, I get that he's sort of doing his job, we disagree about the nuances, but even Snowden didn't have this like maniacal take on Obama, you know, so. Oh no, I'm sure he didn't, I, but I think he knew that if he came back to the United States, he would be arrested. He definitely knew that, and I said to I said to Snowden, I said, "Do you do you think you'll come back?" And he was like, "Yes." And I was like, "Really?" And he was like, "He was like, politics changes, people change." I was like, "Okay, you know, like, <laughs> uh, like I'm yeah. looking forward." And he's young, so, um, so I I didn't say that wasn't like a slick. He is young. He's like thirty or something. Um, so, so if you had the young. opportunity, if suddenly uh, somebody called you up and said that. Uh, Donald Trump would like to talk to you. Would you go talk to Donald Trump? I will not be Kanye West. And <laughs> Kanye got yeah. played. Um, so I think that if there was ever a meeting, it'd have to be like public and like recorded live, like because anything else he would just play you. Um, and I would come with like a set of people so that we could all sort of challenge. But I don't, I'm not convinced that there's like a lot there anyway to like, you know, but he got Kanye good.
Oh, he sure did, yeah. He got caught. He sure did get him. Do you think, um, just to stay on this media thing for a moment, um, what's happened to the black press? There used to be a very vibrant black press in this country that kept, frankly, the mainstream media honest on, the, on a lot of stories. There were stories that appeared in the black press that you wouldn't see in the, in the mainstream press without their pressure. Uh, do you think we need to bring back a black press? Would there be a would there be a market for one? Yeah, I don't even know if it's like bring back as much as it's like fund the press that exists, right? So you think about all the places that have just been underfunded. That still, you think about the Afro newspaper in Baltimore. You think about all these local presses that just have no money, that aren't being funded, that aren't being resourced in ways that make sense. And I think that that has to be a part of the conversation, which is different than creating new outlets. I think Blavity sure. is a great example of like a new outlet that exists and like Blavity does good work and you know we know those people really well. But you think about all the places that just don't have the resources to do the work that they need Where to do. Where would you find those resources? Should this be um, public sources? Should it be business sources? How would, or how would we do that? How would we put that together? I don't know, I don't spend as much time as a philanthropist because uh, I am broke, but I think that um, I want to believe it's like a, a mix of private public I think could do this work really well. Yeah, I mean, there, there have been some places where newspapers have been saved in a kind of private-public partnership, but I don't know that that's been true of any, any uh, or, or like community support for the, I don't know if the, that's been true of the black press at all or not. And we even think about like the stories that do get told and don't get told. I spend most of my time organizing around the police and mass incarceration, and like you think about, uh, you know, I'm shocked about a lot of things, but you think about a, third of all the people killed by a stranger in this country is actually killed by a police officer. And for all of the viral videos that you've seen, it's like we actually, no outlet has actually told the story of the structural issues with policing in ways that make sense. So like you think about in places like California, there's a law that says that any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result in discipline regardless of the outcome. That doesn't make sense. In Cleveland, they destroy police officer disciplinary records every two years. In Chicago, they destroy them every five years. And in uh, Maryland, my hometown, uh, my home state, I'm from Baltimore, is that there's a law that says that uh, you can file an anonymous complaint against a police officer for everything except brutality. And you're like, okay, well, that doesn't make sense. And it's like, how do we make sure we have presses that actually tell these stories? You know, we arrest more people for weed than all violent crimes combined. The three biggest mental health facilities in this country are actually prisons and jails, not hospitals. Like, those things, that is wild, you know? It's like the least visited people in prison and jail are actually women. Like women don't get visited often. Women are the people who visit men in jail, uh, but women don't get visited. And like we don't even tell those stories, you know? Every time I email Josh, who is somebody I know who's incarcerated, I have to buy an electronic stamp to email him. The number of stamps I buy is predicated on how long the email is, and I can only buy stamps in books. That is a scam. And like who is telling these stories, you know That's what I mean? crazy. You have and to I, do that. I think about the press. Now I, but let's talk about the police for a minute. Um, one could, could come away from your book believing or, or with the impression that you don't think the police can, can be reformed at all, that, that you're not hopeful about law enforcement reform. I certainly think that we can live in a world without the police. I'm like totally open to alternatives to policing. You think about... Um, you think about in, med in, in medicine, we literally slit people's wrists for a thousand years and called it healthcare. We were like, we're draining the impurities. It's like, no, you actually killed them. Yeah. And like, yikes, right? Or they're like, oh, their blood pressure went down. It's like, because they had no blood, right? Like, right. That is what we did for a thousand years and called it healthcare. It's like, we've been doing this whole thing that we call policing for a pretty long time. And like, it actually isn't leading to these incredible decreases in community violence. It's just not like that actually isn't happening. So I'm completely open to what alternatives look like. I do think that if we are gonna say that the police have to exist in this way, that we need to challenge a couple things that like, I'm all about training, like sign me up for a good training program. I don't know what a training module looks like not to kill a nine year old. It's like, that to me isn't a training issue, that's something else, right? Well, people have to believe that they will not get away with that for them to stop doing that. And believe it because it's true, right? And and like, because it's true. And they have to believe they will be punished and lose their livelihood and suffer for that kind of error. Yep. But they don't believe that. Well, they don't, why should they believe it? Because it's not happening, right? That right. like 99% of officers who commit violence against people aren't charged, you know? So it's like, 
you have no reason to actually believe that it will happen. So until we have robust accountability, like we'll stay doing this. So like training's not the answer, I don't think. I think that, you know, people also talk about unconscious bias. And the reality is, is that some of this bias is very conscious. Like where was the unconscious part of it? So you think about in Starbucks when the manager called the police on those two black guys, like that seemed conscious to me. Like I don't know what the unconscious part of this stuff is. So I worry that we index on things that aren't accountability. Well that was that was ignorance. That was that was just plain ignorance and malice. Ignorance, racism, like that, it well, can also yes. be racism. It was racism. Yes, Yeah. which no is not the same thing as ignorance. No, well, it, racism is ignorant. Ignorance is not racism, okay. Um. <laughs> racism. I get it. Um, what, what ever happened to the old models of community policing where the police would uh, be assigned to communities, get to know those communities, do, and, and understand what their needs were. I mean, maybe this is an old sort of 60s liberal vision that never was achieved. Uh, is, is anybody trying that anymore, as far as you know? I think people are. The challenge that we have with community policing, or like the idea of it, is that it's still really race-based. So it's only people of color and poor people <coughs> that we feel like they have to like play football with your son, high five him when he gets off the bus, all these things to treat him like a normal person. And like, they're not having a high five Timmy on the Upper West Side to not kill him, you know what I mean? But it's only poor people that like, I gotta play football and be at the after school program and do all this stuff to like treat your child like a whole human being. So the idea of people being embedded in community isn't necessarily a, a negative thing writ large, but like the way we see it play out in communities is still really race-based. So you don't think that could be revived in some fashion with, with uh, communities designing the way they relate to the police? Yeah, but I would go out on a limb and say that I think that police officers can just like not do stop and frisk and they don't need to know you not to stop and frisk you, right? Like they could just not pull over all the black people who drive down the road and like they don't need to know you not to pull you. Like I believe those things. You think about New York City as a great example is 90% of the people arrested in New York City for marijuana are black and brown. You and I both know it's not only black and brown people in New York City smoking weed. No, like that is crazy, right? Yeah. And like you don't need to know all the black and brown people not to arrest them for smoking weed. Like that is... But that community policing sort of undergirds this notion that like relationships equal justice. Yeah. And like in white communities, we see that they don't need the relationship to live in a world that's just. I'm looking for some slender read of hope here that we can reform some of these institutions uh, because we're not gonna do away with police. Oh, we can't, you know, people didn't think we were gonna do away with slitting people's wrists and draining blood either. You yeah. know, I think that like the accountability stuff is really, it's like the structural thing. So there are places across the country, like in Austin, Austin has this clause that says that um, when police officers are suspended for one, two or three days, then it gets recoded as a written reprimand. And you're like, well, that's weird. Uh, Portland, Portland, Oregon has a clause that says that, um, the officer has to be disciplined in the least embarrassing way to the officer and the department. And you're like, I don't even know, what's the least embarrassing discipline? I don't even know what that looks like. It's like no discipline, you know, like, um, so it, unless we fight at the structural level, I actually don't know what accountability looks like, that it has to be these deeply structural things that you all know, you've been to trainings, you've been to sessions. It's like if you went to a million trainings and you knew you weren't gonna get in trouble, like why would your behavior change? It wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like there has to be like accountability with teeth. Uh, and you know, there are 18,000 police departments in the country. So it is, some of this stuff will be really local by local. When we met with President Obama when he was president, uh, we were trying to get him to condition DOJ funding with accountability mechanisms in police departments because the DOJ funds almost every single police department in the country and like that was gonna be our lever. There's also a big thing with the data that if you get killed in this country by a police officer and a newspaper doesn't write about you, then you don't exist in the data set. So any number you've ever heard about police violence comes from the aggregate of newspaper reports, which is really wild. So the database that you probably know well is the Washington Post database. It's the most public one that people know. The problem with the Post database is that it only includes on-duty killings that include a gun. So Eric Garner is not in the database because those officers were on duty, but he wasn't killed with the gun. Botham Jean, not in the database because she was off duty, off duty and he was killed with the gun, right? 
and like we think that that's just an incomplete reading of the problem. So are you fixing that? Is the post reasonable about listening to the need for that change? So we created a whole nother database, but no, the post sort of is sort of doubling down on guns as like the arbiter. So, you know, when officers go home and shoot their wives in the head, we think that that is police violence. When officers like tase people to death, interesting thing about taser deaths is that Taser deaths increase uh, during the summer, and I was like, why do they increase during the summer? Is that tasers exacerbate a lot of health conditions that only become present in the summer, or like during warm weather, which is interesting. So we, we the data shows these like weird spikes in, or not weird anymore, because we can explain it, um, in taser deaths. So people often think about tasers as less than lethal, but in warm months, they are actually pretty lethal in a way that people don't even think about when they think about these issues. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, put down the gun, get a taser. But it's like, you tase somebody who has asthma, and all of a sudden, like, you've killed them. You just didn't shoot them. Do you know what I mean? So where are you getting the information for your database that the Washington Post doesn't have? Or is it just that you're defining things differently? So same, same media reports, like same, it's the same raw source, it's like media reports. Um, you also think about, because the government doesn't accurately correct, collect data around police violence, is that there's some places in Texas where it looked, when we started this in 2015, where it looked like white people were being killed disproportionately more than people of color. And what we found is that Latinos were being miscoded as white because it was just like names was all they were going on. So like there's a lot of work to still be done with the data. You'd be shocked at how little we know, and even, you know, a lot of people push in the movement space and say, why do we focus on men so much? Like, why is it a conversation about like men who are victims and da da da? And the reality is, is like 95, 97% of the people killed by police are men. But when we start to look at the violence of the police that doesn't result in death, it is heavily women, it's heavily members of the LGBT community. When you look at sexual assault, when you look at verbal abuse, when you look at those things, and we just don't have good raw data on that, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't organize around it. So Dre, before we turn to questions uh, in the room, there's one other topic I wanted to bring up. And that is um, whether there's an opportunity now with Trump as president and Trump so obviously, let's just call it what it is, racist. I mean, the way he treats uh, black reporters compared to other reporters is one of the most obvious symptoms. Is there some way to start a new dialogue in this country about race? Can, can we convince uh, the opposition to Trump to talk more about this? I don't know about the opposition to Trump, but I think there's always an opportunity to, to, to sort of do the conversation better. You know, people talk about truth and reconciliation often, but they don't want to acknowledge that the truth has to come before the reconciliation. Like people want to sh jump straight to reconciliation without right. dealing with the truth. And I was at a, um, I was at this party not too long ago, and I set the context for the party as, a, as context, not as a humble brag. Uh, but I was at Miss Tina, who's Beyonce's mom. She had this, this event. So I'm at this thing, and I'm wearing this like plastic coat. It's a wearable art event, so we're all like wearing art. So I'm wearing this coat, this plastic coat that has facts about justice on it. And one of the facts is that uh, white high school dropouts have more wealth than all black college graduates, which is true. And this record exec walks up to me and he's like, is this true? And I'm like, yes. And he goes, I don't know. And I'm like, I don't know if you get not to know, right? Like this is, uh, this is sort of what it is. And then he pauses and he goes, um, he says, well, you know, the only reason that white people have more wealth is that there are more white people. And I'm like, what is happening? You know, I'm like, I'm like, am I being punked at the party? Is this like, uh, you know, is Miss Tina, like, is there a hidden camera? I'm like, what is happening? And we're at this party, so I gotta be like a little, a little chill. So I just, I, with a straight face, I say to him, I go, the only reason there are more white people is that you killed half the people and enslaved the other half. And he, like, his face is like, <laughs> and I'm just like real, I'm like, hey. Um, but it was this moment of like, we actually can't let people off the hook for the way that they revise history. That like the reason that white people have wealth is that we gave white people wealth, right? It wasn't that white people had to work incredibly hard for it. Like we, get, we gave white people houses with 1% interest rates. We gave white people education. We gave white people land. That the highway administration in places like Alabama was taken over by the White Citizens Council and paved over people's neighborhoods to create what we now call the suburbs. Like 
this was all intentional and by design. It's only when we talk about people of color and poor people that suddenly nobody has an imagination anymore. They're like, what do we do with poor people? They're like, I don't know. And they're like, everybody has to be a small business owner. It's like, I actually shouldn't have to own 10 small businesses to eat dinner. That that is like a wild assertion, right? White people got to be lazy and basic and mediocre and we still gave them all these things at scale. Like we should be able to guarantee people breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's not like a radical notion. You know, it's not radical that we're like, people should have somewhere to sleep. Like these things are pretty basic. And it starts with us saying that like, we won't let people off the hook for like the truth of how we got here and like how we get to the other side. But there are white people who were not, who did not benefit from those advantages and you know that too. I mean, I can assure you that no one in my family benefited from such advantages just because of my personal history. Um, and that doesn't mean that I can't see the truth in what you're saying about how black people and brown people have been overlooked and have been mistreated and have been the object of these things. But it's not all white people doing this to all black people. But you did benefit. And that's like, this is like the rub of white supremacy, right? Is that like the way, um, the way, so two things. One is, one is that like as a straight white man, it's like you potentially have benefited more than anybody else has benefited from like at, at the structural level. So it, it's not about like how a person benefits, but it is about like the way that you are able to move through the world in a way that is the result of systemic inequities. Uh, that, there like, are systemic that inequities, weren't, no that question. You didn't personally do it, but like the way that you are able to like access government services, move through the world, just like in the interpersonal sense, in the structural way is like the result of domination and like that is just as that is real the second thing is that i'm mindful that white supremacy is like a smog and part of our understanding of white supremacy as a smog is that we all inhale it and part of our work is to see that we inhale it and to make sure that we that it doesn't do damage to us as we inhale it like that is a part of our work but it is but it is true that like you certainly benefited from a system of white supremacy uh, the accumulation of wealth the access like all of those things so whether you personally did or not uh, you like whether you personally did with wealth is one thing but as a white man structurally you certainly did yeah well some of this we might have to discuss on another occasion privately because i do i do challenge the sense that I mean, I think you have to look at it structurally, of course you do, and, and you have to look at the system, but you have to also have to look at uh, what's happened to individual people and how, how they've fared in this system. They haven't, they've fared below the average of their group in some, on some occasions. But there is no metric that I have ever seen where white men have fared below any metric of people of color. No, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that white men generally have but I think there are particular people who have, and those may be for very particular reasons. Yeah, but, but that's not- Including the, discrimination of various sorts. But that, I don't know, Sandy. I mean, we can talk about this offline, but that, that is not, like when we think about racism, we think about structures and systems, that is not, that has never been the metric, right? It has always been about like how- No, it hasn't groups, been the metric, that's true. How groups yeah. fare and the level of access and privilege that you have in the world is not simply the result of your hard work. That is just not true. And no, that's, I, I agree with that. And like, and that is what, so when we think about the, um, when we think about even the stat that like white high school dropouts have more wealth than black college graduates is wild. That is, that a, is wild. That is wild and true and crazy. You know, you even think about like a ban the box, raise your hand if you've ever heard of ban the box, like ban the box legislation. Okay. So ban the box legislation it passed in many places across the country. And what it does is that it makes it illegal for on hiring applications for there'd be a box that says, were you ever convicted of a crime? Like that is what ban the box did. People thought ban the box was going to change the world. Big thing. Ban the box is a good policy. It is actually good policy so that people can't discriminate on the front end. The first set of data that came out about employment after ban the box passed actually had black people doing worse in the workplace. And the question might be why, raise your hand if you think you know why black people did worse in the workplace after ban the box passed. If you're a professor, you don't count because you, <laughs> you might have seen the research. Go ahead. Well, I, I could be wrong, but I'm assuming. <laughs> I, I could be wrong, but I'm assuming it's because the people looked at the sheep and assumed because they were black, they would have a similar problem. You repeat that. That is it. So the, so the is like people literally just assumed all the black people are criminals anyway. Right. And you're like, that is wild, right? 
So even some of the best policy we put forth like literally just runs into racism. And like the racism is like structural, it's deep, it's coded. There's actually new research out that shows uh, that race, not partisanship, is actually like the dividing line. That people often think that people who identify as liberal or Democrats, that they like believe that they are like more progressive. And like there is, um, there's a guy who did this research around some of the, in the Obama years, where he asked people questions like, is unemployment like higher or lower? Like things that there are just like, it is true. Like there are, these are facts, right? And what he can map is that when Obama was president, people who like essentially believed in injustice, um, people who believed in justice would say, uh, p people who believed in like racial equity, the way he phrased it was a little more complicated. They would say, that like the employ unemployment rate was lower than people who didn't like you could map all of pe you could map like a range of people's like fact based uh, thinking by how they thought about race and not by partisanship which was interesting so I worry about the way that we like have taught the history of race in the country the way that we um, think about structural issues in the country um, and the way that the the way that we don't sort of acknowledge the structural issues actually change the way we think about and solutions so what are we going to do about that oh I think that we fight like hell and i think that we um yeah. we push people to change things at the structural risk. so you think about like trump just gave 700 billion dollars to the military which is a lot of money it would take 125 billion dollars to take every single person out of poverty right that if they can rewrite the tax code on the back of scrap paper we can actually get rid of mass incarceration in a generation that part of this is us like fighting and pushing and making the biggest asks that we can possibly ask and also reminding people that nobody loses in a world where everybody eats dinner right like nobody loses in a world where every single kid can read and write. Nobody loses in a world where everybody has access to health care. This is not a zero sum space for so much of this. So much of this, we can create a world where everybody wins. One of the things that white supremacy does though is that it's not interested in equity. And equity is the idea that people get what they need and deserve. White supremacy is interested in domination, right? So when we think about the way white supremacy works is that it says that power is like a pizza pie and some people will always have more and some people will always have less. We want to live in a world where we say that power is something that we share. So it's like a big thing of endless Skittles and all of us can have some Skittles, right? That like this is not about who has more Skittles or who has less. This is about you can get as many handfuls as you want and like that is okay. That we actually have more power when we share it because power is infinite and expansive. But white supremacy is interested in domination. And like we have enough food to feed everybody. There's not like a food shortage, you know what I mean? We have enough land to house everybody. These are choices that are rooted in domination. And we don't want to talk about it because it sounds like so crazy. You're like domination, but it's like no, that is actually that that is actually what's happening. Like we can call it something else, but that is what is at the root of this. And you think about even I said it already, but we arrest more people for weed than all violent crimes combined. Like that is wild to be true today when we are legalizing marijuana all across the country. That's like a wild thing to still be real. You know, you think about in New Jersey. Is um, how many people do you think you have to organize to be a kingpin in New Jersey? How many people have to organize? Yeah, like how many people, if I'm the kingpin, how many people have to work for me to be a kingpin? Not many. Two. That's crazy, right? So you think about like the way the laws are set up. I did something earlier where like um, theft over $300 in Florida is a felony. And in Florida, when you become a felon, you permanently lose the right to vote until the law will change soon. Uh, in Virginia, theft over $200 was a felony until this year. In Chicago, it's $300. In Oklahoma, up until 2001, theft over $50 was a felony. Like, that's wild, you know? And if I'd asked you what a felon is, you would have said, like, blown up a building, killed 10 people. You wouldn't have been like somebody who stole Apple ear pods, you know what I mean? And like, those are choices. And we can actually do right. all of that work at the structural level. Part of the battle is that you need to know that that is like something that you can fight for. And who's going to help us fight for that? Who's going to be the, well, yes, I accept that. <laughs> but who will be the uh, people who will, we will put in power in some fashion to bring about these changes? I think it'll be all of us. I think that there are two models of organizing, right? There's one model of organizing that says do it with me or like me. There's another model of organizing that says we can all be strong together. 
I'm like, I want to believe that we can actually build the capacity of as many people as possible. That I know a lot about mass incarceration and policing, and you can know a lot about it too. Like, I don't, I'm not the only person who can do this work. That all of us can actually do this work. And like, I know that I'm a good entrance for some people, but I'm not the best entrance for everybody, and I'm okay with that. And like, we need to make sure that like we help organize and like build the capacity of as many people as possible. I'm hopeful about this new Congress with all these young people in there, like doing all this stuff that people said you should never do. I'm excited about all these people who are like in power in positions of power now, but I'm mindful that the power has always been in communities, you know, like that has always been power where power has rested and that like systems are designed for you to believe that you don't make an impact. Like that's how they're designed to do that work. And I remember being the chief of human capital in, in the school system in Baltimore. I ran human capital in our school system and I was responsible for all hiring of all employees, including all teachers. And when school opened that year, um, we got, the superintendent got an email from a mother who was like, her kid was in a class with 40 kids in a kindergarten class, which is a whole lot of kids in kindergarten. And the superintendent emails me and she's like, Dre, can you do something about this? And like, because of this one woman's email, I like found another teacher. I didn't know that the class had 40 kids because at the central office, like we don't have that data. So she sent the email, I found another teacher, I split the class up and it was literally because this one woman's an email, you know? And like, you all have an email in you, you have a phone call in you, like you have that in you. And like the system isn't designed to give her the feedback that like her one email is what changed like her kids' classes, like the system isn't designed to do that. But like you have that one email in you, you know? With the new people in the house, I, I just hope they use their access wisely and carefully. Uh, so as not to lose those seats the next time around if Trump outsmarts everyone. I think they'll be fine. I, the House is fine. It's like the Senate, the only thing that confused me about this one is like, who voted for Ted Cruz? I'm like, what is, <laughs> I'm like, Beto was good and it worked. You're like, who was voting for Ted? Like, a, that lot, just, a lot fewer people than Ted Cruz like, thought would do what? so. But I, I was like, what is going, like Ted's not, there are awesome Republicans that are at least smooth. You're like, Ted was none of those things, you know? You're like, who was voting for Ted Cruz? So that was one that I was like, I don't understand. Um, but I'm hopeful about 2020. You know, whoever runs against, whoever beats Trump won't be running against Trump. They'll be running for a vision of America that's bigger than him. And I believe that, you know, what, you know, when I think about Bernie and Hillary, what Bernie did really well was he could paint a picture of the what, like what the world was gonna look like. Bernie didn't really understand the how. Hillary had the how down and couldn't paint a picture of the what, you know? So Bernie was tweeting like, I'm gonna free two million people from jail. You're like, there aren't two million people in federal prison, Bernie. You're like, the how is like this, you're like, yikes. You know, he just didn't, the how is a little questionable. Um, whereas Hillary- Nobody's perfect, right? I mean, but come on, like, somebody didn't tell you the basic numbers, you're just like, yeah. Bernie. Whereas like Hillary, the how, her how, the plan, like, she had it down, you had no clue what it was gonna look like in real life. Like she just couldn't translate that part of it. And I think that was like a real loss. Um, and we met with both of them. And, um, and you know, even Barack, I think about at the end, we pushed him a lot on some of the policing stuff. And I do think that he, he thought he was gonna set up, like he, his administration was gonna set up Hillary to do the, to do the rest of it, because it was at the end of his administration. Uh, what, what is still interesting about Obama is, um, people were so in love with him that they didn't really challenge him the way you thought they were gonna challenge him. So we had two meetings with him, long meetings, and people walked in, people you thought were like fighting, that were like before I walked into the room, I'm like, oh, we going, we about to have it out with President Obama. I walk in, people are like choking on their thank you. They're like, thank you, so You're like, thank you? You know, I just got out of jail in Baton Rouge for the second meeting, I wasn't thankful for very much. And I walk in and like people, you know, it's just like, a, it was really interesting to see how people lost the fight in his presence. And like, that was like a fascinating thing to watch. I remember our second meeting with him. I just got in jail in Baton Rouge and the FBI had just visited my house. So I came in just mad, you know, I was like mad at everybody. And I remember walking up to Loretta Lynch, who's attorney general. And I'm like, hey, Loretta, FBI was at my house a couple of days ago, why? And she very, very kindly, she looks at me and she goes, it's so good to see you, DeRay, and then walks away. I'm like, no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that, Loretta. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to be done. I, I am excited about like how the protesters have generally like held people accountable, pushed people, like made people show up, have run for office. Like I'm excited for those things. And I'm excited for the questions that you might yeah, have. Let's take, let's take questions now. Um, we will.
do, I don't, do we have any floor microphones? I forgot to ask about that before. I don't see them. So there's going to be a real challenge to hear people, and we'll repeat the questions after they're asked. Uh, we didn't we didn't come up with another system. So it's okay. We can start Is right here. Oh, the podium mic. Good, good idea. Okay. We can start over here. Yeah. We saw him first. It's on. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming to Sarah Lawrence Israel. So, DeRay, I follow you on Twitter, and I was just wondering um, if you could kind of talk about like how social media has have you used it as a tool for like um, organizing and things like that, and kind of like how you uh, deal with organization amidst like the possibility of having your like tweets taken out of context and like used for opposite things. Yes, yeah, so I've seen the good and bad of Twitter. The first person ever permanently banned from Twitter was banned for raising money to try and get me killed. So I've seen that part of the platform. Um, I've also seen the beautiful parts of like being able to build community and things like that. It's different today than it was four years ago. Four years ago, like we weren't trying to be famous. We were just trying to get free, right? Like we were like, that's why we were tweeting all day. People now have realized that you can, that there's money and all that stuff in it. And that has just changed the way people use the platform a little bit. Um, I'm one of the reasons why I don't follow, I only follow 900-ish people. And part of that is because, um, is because like I need to know that whatever comes on my timeline I can trust, you know, because I've been burned before by like somebody will tweet something and then I'm like, oh, this happened. And then it'll be like, yeah, that didn't happen. And then I'm in the news. It's like Duran McKesson lies about it. And I'm like, I didn't mean to lie. Like I thought it was true. Um, so I'm mindful about those things. I think that my understanding of the power of language is much more refined that like, I remember I called something lame once and like the disability activist wrote me and was like, that is like ableist. And I was like, I didn't even, I hadn't even thought about that, right? Like, so those sort of things I've just learned so much better. Um, I think about Twitter and the internet as like an accelerant that it doesn't replace the offline organizing. It does accelerate the pace that we can do all of our work. You know what I mean? I do think that some people come to the platform bad and that's not the platform's fault, right? They're like, you were bad way before you opened up a Twitter account. You were bad when you opened up a Twitter account. You were bad when you tweeted. I think that the platforms have a responsibility to make sure that you don't radicalize on the platforms, right? Like, I think that that is like a real thing. I think they have to figure that out. And it'll be interesting to see how long Facebook is able to like stay afloat as they, as their morals like become more and more publicly questionable. For both of you, but mostly. Can you bring the mic from much closer oh, to your mouth? Sorry. Um, this is for both of you, but mostly for Dre. So I agree with you that like people can do dangerous things under the protection of the First Amendment. And that is sort of like a, a fundamental problem with it. But I'm curious as to whether you think, like you kind of questioned the First Amendment and why and like who wrote it and why it was written. So I my question is basically, do you view the responsibility of sort of like changing the conversation and making people responsible as the responsibility of like us to each other? Or do you think that there's like a real case to be made for the state being the one to like that changing the First Amendment to, to empower the state to sort of like control people's discourse? Like that seems dangerous to me. And so that, like, I, that made me sort of hesitant about your question. Or do you think it's more about like responsibility of individuals towards each other? that'll change that first amendment. Yeah, I don't, so, uh, you know, I'm rarely advocating for more state power. What I am saying is that the power imbalance is already there, right? Like, so the state already has the mechanism to decide like what is enforced and what is it, and that is what I'm questioning. So you better believe that if I go outside and start like doing press conferences being like white people shouldn't exist and I call it black nationalism, that somebody is gonna be in my door. And it's not gonna be, like GQ to do a photo spread, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's only with like white nationalism that it is like, like that is a matter of power. So I'm calling into question that the enforcement mechanism is already imbalanced and that what the First Amendment does not protect is speech that incites violence. And I would say that like when it is like straight white men who like that sort of vein of people who wrote the constitution who are the people the jurists like when they are the people deciding like 
what incites violence or not. It's like, they're not going to be hurt by that. Like, they are not, impl Richard Spencer could say a million things and they're going to be fine, right? Richard Spencer could say some things in black communities that will rile up people and lead to real danger, right? But when the only people who are like the lens of like what incites violence or not are people who like don't share the backgrounds, think that this is all really theoretical and interesting, are like, that is what I'm calling dangerous. I, I, I just want to add to that that I'm very suspicious of the state stepping in to figure out what's dangerous and and what I mean I think I think we have to have good sense about what might promote violence, but you have to remember that if you if we endorse the state modifying the First Amendment now, we're endorsing Donald Trump modifying the First Amendment. And it's not going to be better when he gets finished. I think, I think we know that for sure. I am also terrified of any constitutional convention because the American people have some really wacko ideas about what the Constitution should permit and what it should ban. And as imperfect as the one we have now is, I, I, I don't think we should trade it in without, without really extreme, extreme caution. And so I think the First Amendment is, in its simplicity, is a brilliant statement. It's not perfect, but we have to, but we have to live better with it and, and hope for some wisdom in its implementation. Yeah, I'll just end by saying I think that the status quo is a luxury for some people and a danger for a lot of other people. And I think that like you see with Charlottesville, I think is a case study for like the imbalance of power. That if any people of color have push those officers the way that white people push those officers, it would have been a massacre and those officers would have been fine. You know what I mean? Like it would be a whole different day in America and the officers would be the heroes and the people of color would have been the villains who were attacking law enforcement. And like what you saw in Charlottesville was a was a reminder that like the system actually is not collapsing at all, that it is like that the First Amendment is like in practice meant to protect a certain people's speech and not everybody's, and like that's what you saw in real, it was no longer theoretical, well, we saw it. But that's not, that's something we can work very hard to fix while we're working on this agenda. We can try to make sure that the First Amendment protects people equally. Yeah, I'm just it, saying it'll I, don't take see time, that, no I don't question. see that work happening. I, I'm all about fixing it. I'm just saying like that's not, that's not how people are leading this conversation and that is not what's happening in real time. Yeah, I mean I don't, I don't disagree with you about what happened in Charlottesville. And I think it was shocking. I mean, the biggest shock is in the end, they indicted four people in, in Charlottesville that we'd never even heard of, which shows us some, once, once the federal government decided to pay attention to it. So it shows how deeply that white supremacist stream runs in a dangerous part of American society. But I think, I don't think the First Amendment is gonna be improved upon if it's changed, is my. I saw you back there, gray, the gray hoodie. I don't know if that's a hoodie, maybe it's a shirt. It's great. <laughs> is it already? No, it's a crew no. neck. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Hi, so uh, my question is for D-Ray. So I think that when we're talking about like the context of free speech, I think like acknowledging like the power dynamic, especially for black women, but black women of like particular black backgrounds, like I'm from the south side of Chicago. There's already a narrative put to me before I open my mouth, right? Um, and I think that how do we as privilege, having the privilege of education as black people who are educated, how do we properly give back to our communities and speak out and be vocal without preventing ourselves from getting ahead? Yeah, two things come to mind. One is that, you know, and this is what we remind teachers all the time, is that people often have the experiences before they have the language, and we often penalize people for not having the language, right? So if I walk into a sixth grade classroom right now and say, T raise your hand if you've had a racist encounter this week, they will be like, I have no clue what you're talking about, right? If I say, raise your hand if you've ever been treated differently because of the color of your skin, they, ha they, have a, they had the experience, right? I lived in a food desert before I had the language to talk about a food desert, but I, I, like, I thought my great grandmother just liked driving to Giant that was 20 minutes away, you know? No, we lived in a food desert and we couldn't walk to one, right? Like I, I know now, and what you find is that, especially when people, go to places like this, and I went to a place like this, so that is not a, you know, I'm saying it about all of us, is sometimes you go home and you get 
your language is so different than it was before that you get frustrated that people don't have the language to describe the world around them is if they don't have the experience of living in that world, right? So some of our work is to validate the experiences that people have and like help them build the language while not taking away from the power of the experience, right? The second is that like what you have been able to do here, whether you appreciate it now or not, is that like your ability to just like be and imagine is just so much greater than it was before that like you're in a place where like the resource, all that stuff has allowed you to imagine and grow and think. And the imagination is actually a skill, you know, like you do it, you can, you can crank out a paper in four hours and it actually be readable and like have real ideas and something novel because like you practiced thinking and like da da da. And like so much of the work that we can do with our peers is like, practice the skill of imagination, like be around people and talk about like, what would we put in this neighborhood if we did this? Or like, what's your community? Like that stuff you take for granted that like you do that just, like that you walk down the hallway and you're like, oh, did you see that thing? And did Foucault do that? Like that, that is just sort of like, uh, you're like, oh, this is college. But like that can actually be life, right? And like that is like a skill that you hone and practice. And the third is that there are many ways to show up in community that like I'm obsessed with the structural stuff. So when I think about like my work right now, it's like if we change felony theft amounts, it'll free a ton of people from jail. Right. Like so I'm like fascinated with like how do I do the most structural or whatever. But I'm able to get to that point because I did a lot of program work already. Right. So I like open up an after school center. I taught. I like volunteered. So some of it, too, is like, is there a way for you to be in community differently in your own community, like volunteering or like being in a homeless, you know, like homeless shelter, stuff that you would never have normally done, but like this is your way of using your privilege to give back. Because what you find is that like you'll go to some programs that are like really, they're like fine, but you might be able to come and help them think about a problem they've had differently. And like that's actually really important too. You know, so when I was a chief human capital in the school system in Baltimore, uh, this is sort of wonky, but in Baltimore City Public Schools, they can't, the payroll department, which didn't report to me, um, can't do direct deposit on, first, on the first paycheck. So every new employee gets a paper check for the first pay. We employ 11,000 people. It's a nightmare. And the superintendent, she was like, DeRay, please figure out how to give out the checks so that both of us don't get fired. And I'm like, cool, because the woman before me, they screwed it up and people were outside till midnight trying to get their checks, right? So it was a nightmare. So I come in and I am, I pull everybody in a meeting, it's like 30 people, they don't report to me, like some of these people don't report to me. And I'm like, well, just walk me through how we gave out the checks last year. It was a nightmare. So 200 schools, we have 11,000 staff, and they were like five vans go out in the morning to give out the checks. I'm like, okay, well, mathematically, these five vans could possibly do it in seven hours. And I'm like, what happens when a van gets to the school? They're like, well, the van pulls up and the driver calls the secretary. And I'm like, well, what happens if the secretary doesn't answer? They're like, he drives away. I'm like, well, this is why nobody got their pay, you know? Um, so literally, I'm like, we should put two people in the vans and somebody should walk the checks in. They're like, you're a genius. I'm like, I'm not a genius, right? <laughs> like, that was just me bringing like a fresh perspective to a whole problem. And you'd be shocked at how like, being in this world that you're in has allowed you to like have a different perspective and you can probably bring a fresh perspective to an old problem in a way that like you don't value but it requires you to being in proximity to the place i don't know i didn't point you who did you call it so i'm just wondering where this resistance to acknowledge um, privilege from these structures is coming from when <laughs> you're, you, I'm not sure exactly the language that was used, I can't remember, but sort of um, where the resistance to acknowledge this um, privilege just, I don't know, despite any personal life challenges that just all of these structures are um, meant to benefit you just because of your appearance and that like you know you can just exist in this space and uh and without any sort of fear based of uh, fear of I don't know, any sort of violence that other people can't you know is that a question for me yeah <laughs> i just i just you know it seems like unnecessary resistance you know now you can just you know, acquiesce to the <laughs> Challenge. First of all, I think you're misinterpreting what I said, but that's okay. 
Um, I think How? if I, I'm, I think if I told you my personal story, which I don't think has a proper place at I don't, this I moment. I just don't this. think that the personal story was what um, was presented to I, when the question was asked. Well, that's, that, I have to interpret it on the basis of my life experience. And if I, but not I, everyone has like that privilege would, to do well, that. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to satisfy you with an answer, so I'm just going to say one more thing, which is that if I, if I did something that I think would be inappropriate right now to tell you my own personal story, I think you might have a different perspective on this, but I'm not going to do that right now. I do that. What's your name? Sienna. What is it? Savannah? Sienna. Sienna. I'm up here making up names. Savannah. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. Yeah. Hi, Sienna. Um, so yeah, and we should probably talk about this offline. I, I think that this... I think that I think that there is a um, there is an understood way that we think about white supremacy as being deeply structural, and that people benefit from it whether you participate in it or not, right? And that it is not a personal thing; that it is like the way it, the way systems work. And I think that your framing of this idea of safety is actually like a beautiful framing. That like when we when we work with people to think about the way that privilege works, is one of the questions that we ask them is like, when's the last time you felt unsafe, right? And when I ask women the last time they felt unsafe, they can think about a million times where they felt unsafe in their body, in their mind. When I think about, when I ask trans men and women when they felt unsafe, they can think about a million ways in their mind and body. When I think about the moments that I felt unsafe, I can think about a million. When I've asked white straight men when they felt unsafe, they've said they, they, they get, it is just a very different way to think about the world. And like, that is, that is privilege, that is power, and like that is structural. So I do you think, I think that part of the challenge is that um, one of the ways that I think she is experiencing, I think I might be joining her in experiencing your push around the personal narrative is like a deflection from owning like the structural piece. And there is this, that I think that the question is sort of like, where is that coming from? And it seems like it's coming from like you being strongly convinced about like your personal narrative is an aberration potentially from the structure. It, it, it may be an aberration, but uh, to I think to indulge in too much stereotyping about this and, and uh, uh, finding or developing a stereotype that you think applies to everybody is a disservice. I don't think these stereotypes do apply to everybody. And Sienna may feel that uh, I don't in, think there's the any, dis, any stereotypes about white males that have ever done a disservice to them at a structural level where they've become disadvantaged. Well, you, can, you can believe that. OK. Huh? I think that might be right, though. Um, hi, so my question is for DeRay, and it's, um, do you feel that um, the changes you have in mind, the political policies you have in mind, can be enacted by working within the Democratic Party or an established political party, or should it happen um, independently of those structures? I think it's like a both and, you know, when I interviewed Ocasio-Cortez, I asked her, I said, you know, people really wonder why you ran as a Democrat, right? Like you, your ideas seem bigger than this. So like people, people want you to be an independent, right? Like, I think that was like a fair question because people believe that about her. And what she said to me, I'll never forget. She said to Ray, like, I understand that the Democratic Party is every single door I knocked on, that the party was like every mother, every teacher, everybody who worked at a bar. She was like, that was the party. She's like, I never confuse the party with those people who are in Washington and in, like, in these positions. She's like, the party are all those people's doors I knocked on. And she's like, I'm, like, I am responsible to those people, and like, that's the party to me. And like, I believe that, I think that works. I was on the DNC transition team, and part of 
the reality of being on the transition team is that that I know that the Democratic Party is not the only way that we can organize. It is the way that people organize right now, and I think that that is like I think it works. But I think that like can there be a third party? Sure, yes. Like I think that that could be a real thing. I think the independents. You know, I love Angus King in Maine. Angus is a you know, me and Chris both know Angus, um, and Angus I think holds it down for like the the independents in the Senate. So I think that it's possible, but I I caution the. I don't think it has to be either or. I think that we can like do what we need to do within this structure right now while we work to build something that works for more people in a better way. And I think that this Congress actually, I think that this wave of people who just won might be the wave that like helps us do it. She, do you see her in the middle? Are those hoops? Are they hoops? Yes, hoops. Love. It. I didn't know if they were like hoops or like dangling. And I'm like, from the Bronx, so. Okay. I'd represent. <laughs> she said yes. I brought up you and Cardi B. Was Cardi B your neighbor? No. <laughs> uh, my question has to do with Sarah Lawrence specifically. Um, this is an institution that costs more than what most people in this country make in a year, and it's 67% white. Yet it is a sort of bastion of these high-minded leftist ideals. So I was wondering. What is the responsibility of college students to sort of move beyond their sort of privilege of education to do the real work? And how do we mobilize privileged people with really good ideas to do really good work? It's a good push. So I'd say three things come to mind. One is that like you have to come out of this place a better reader, writer, and thinker. If the only thing you've done in four years is fight the institution, you actually just didn't get a fair deal. That like if you don't come out of here like more able to like fight about ideas and like deal with complexity and did like you just didn't make this place show up for you enough and like this place exists so that you can like get everything that you need out of it and, it was, and I don't regret anything about Bowdoin but if I was to go back I would have probably like taken one more class and stuff. like I would have just like zapped the place out a little bit more because like you'll see that there are very few places that will ever exist like this again in your world unless you like stay at a college right so this one. The second is that like you, whatever issue you really care about, you should also make sure this place teaches you a lot about it. You know, I'm in a lot of places now and I'm with college students who are like, Duray, I want to do something around mass incarceration. I'm like, well, what do you want to do about mass incarceration? They're like, mass incarceration. And I'm like, well, that's just annoying, right? <laughs> that like somebody here is an expert on some something or they can find out something. Like, you should actually like use this opportunity to learn about some of the like nuances and structures because as an activist on the outside, what I tell you now is that there are scholars doing stuff that if we had known about four years ago, we'd be in a different place. And like you just are in a place where you can actually un uncover that stuff. You know, we did the first ever database of, of police union contracts in the country, and it was dope. It was a hundred city the hundred biggest cities. We did it, some some professor somewhere saw it like replicated some of it, expanded the data set. We saw it in a law review journal because he had to cite our stuff because we did the first ever study. I randomly emailed this guy, he's a professor somewhere, and I'm like, hey, can we talk? He's like, sure. I'm like, can you just send us like, all you had other contracts in this chart that we didn't have, and like, instead of us having the FOIA them, can you just send them to us? He sends me 800 contracts. I'm like, when were you ever gonna, like, when was anybody gonna see these? You were just sitting on 800 contracts that like weren't posted on a website, weren't publicly available. And like, luckily we believed in the Academy enough to reach out, but like you actually are already in it, you know? And like, there's so many underexplored areas that like you can actually do some incredible research and like thought leadership while you're here that doesn't require you sitting in somebody's office, doesn't require you like shutting down a building, but like you can actually do your part. And the third is that there's so much left to be done that like from a knowledge perspective, that there are like no good data sets on bail, that we have not done anything like substantive around, um, there's one company that if you have commissary, if you're like, if you're incarcerated, you have commissary and you get released, uh, there's like a debit card company that the commissary funds get put on and it's a scam. They charge you like five dollars every time you use it. There's like nobody who's done any research around that. You're like there are all these way underexplored areas that like you could do as like a thesis or like, you know, like you could do it in a way that would change the landscape of the space. And part of it is like believing that like your work can have an impact and that you can actually add value when you're at a place like this. And like you can, and like I can tell you the number of people in the academy who have 
helped us do incredible things that we would have never known about if we hadn't just like reached out to a random professor. And like there's one, we found out recently that there's one company that writes the police policies for 3,000 of the biggest police departments. I randomly tweeted about something. This professor sent me a note. I called her. She happens to be the professor on this thing. We got access to all this stuff that we would have never ever known as activists if not for her. You know, and it's like, so I have deep faith in like the work that the academy can actually do to change the landscape. I also want to add one little thing, which is that I have a very basic principle when I've tried to, as, as a college president in various roles, when I've helped other people, uh, when I've been in a, in a position, a privileged position to help people, and they've asked, well, you know, what can I do? How do I thank you? And I always say the way to do that is you make sure you do it for two or three or four more people. Do whatever it is. Extend, use your access to privilege to help other people. And if you just sort of, if more people did that, I think we'd reach a whole lot more people. I think we have time for a couple more, one more question. This one over there. I think she, I think she got it over there. Um, I have a question for both or either of you. Um, you talked about the idea of not having the language but having experiences. Um, and I guess my question is, or I think a lot of times there's converse, really necessary conversations where that gets stopped short because of the language involved and because of either lack of proper language or um, kind of the uh, need to have the right language. And I'm wondering, for both of you, how important language is in conversations about change? Do you want to go? Sure. Uh, I think language is terribly important. And I think that uh, we underestimate the necessity to communicate more completely with people and, and the need to avoid talking down to people. I think one of the great problems of Hillary Clinton's campaign, to get very specific about it, was that she had somehow lost the ability to talk to people, to talk to people who, who, who needed things that she could bring to government and that she could do. And this guy who just swept in and had, I mean, my, my the, 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 the worst symbol of this in my mind was shortly before the election, there was a night when she was in New York having dinner with donors at some fancy restaurant, and Donald Trump on that same night was in my hometown in Pennsylvania talking to 40,000 people and winning them over because he had this, he had developed this ability to trick people into believing that he was sincere and, and that he could deliver for them. Uh, I think there's been a real failure of communication on the part of people who have a lot to offer but have forgotten how to explain it. I think that, you know, language um, does way more work than we give it credit for sometimes. You think about when the right labeled parts of Obamacare as having death panels, that was brilliant language, right? Because you didn't need to know much to be like, okay, I see some people deciding who lives and dies. And like the language actually did all of the work for. You think about even like, you know, the, the idea of pro-life and pro-choice is like great language for one side and bad language for the other side, right? So I think that language, like the framing is really, is really important. I think what the right does really well is that or not even well, is that they are always engaged in nostalgia. So the language they use is always language that we've sort of survived before. So like the mental image, all the stuff, like make America great again, all this stuff is already, the, the hardest work has already been done. On the left, what is really hard is that we're always trying to tell a story about a world we've never seen before, right? So you you don't know how to like paint a perfect picture of universal health care because you've never seen it, right? You've never seen a world where like every kid can read and write. You you can't describe perfectly a world where every kid has breakfast, lunch, and dinner because you've never seen it before. So the best language we're involved in on our side is almost always a language of make believe, and that's just like hard work sometimes. So like so much of that work is like to practice and practice and try and get it right and da da da. I, you know, I often joke that my bar is always my Aunt Mink, that if I can't explain it to my Aunt Mink, then it doesn't work. That she is like my like bar. And not because Aunt Mink is stupid or slow or anything. Like, 
it is that our mink just doesn't spend all day watching CNN. So I know if I can like hook her on an issue, then I got her. And I and if I can do it with our mink, then I can do it with a lot of people. So when I was talking to our mink about Kavanaugh, I wasn't saying to our mink, um, I wasn't entering with Roe v. Wade. I was saying, oh, Mink, you know, they're trying to hide the papers. They are hiding the papers from us. She's like, they're hiding the papers? I'm like, girl, they are hiding the papers. <laughs> when he was staff secretary, they hiding all the papers. She was like, that's bad. I'm like, and he don't believe in a woman's right to choose. She's like, he don't. I'm like, girl, he don't believe in none of this. They hiding the papers. And it, but I knew that, like, I had to create an entrance for her, and, like, the language had to help her into enter, enter the work differently, and I had to meet her there, right? And I had to not be so self-righteous to believe that the only way to enter the work was the way that I entered the work. So when I think about the power of language, it is, like, at its best, what it does is, like, set people up to enter. And it is best what it does is serve as like an on ramp is that we have to be mindful too not to let the language like not to let people sort of in it there's one thing to not have the language there's another thing to reject the language right and there's some people who like reject the language and refuse to like like take heed to what the words mean and to what the words do and like we should fight those people at every step of the way like the reason that I talk about experience without the language with kids is that they often literally just, they've never heard, they just like don't have the facility yet. But a lot of adults know the language, they know the words and they are rejecting them, right? So the people on the right are rejecting the language of white supremacy and calling it white nationalism. And like we should fight people on that every single time. It was great to be here. I think we're done. We're giving it back over to Crystal. Thank you guys. So thank you so much to Ray and Sandy for being with us. Um, this is the last panel this fall in Difference in Dialogue, but we have many coming this spring on religious pluralism, on genetics, on life in the classroom, and I encourage you to uh, watch for those. We do for our neighbors in the community are here. We have a, a, a new residency coming um, with the first concert at the beginning of December, December 3rd, the Ying Quartet here in residency, and we welcome you to that as, as another public event. DeRay has agreed to um, sign books for those who are interested just outside. And so thank you again. I know there are conversations that were started tonight that will continue in many ways. Thank you. Thank you.